thank you very much again. Um, before we go into some more details, I just wanted to remind everyone of the timeline that we are looking at for the major revision of EAD. Um, the general um, submission to the SAA committee, so SAA Standards Committee and SAA Council uh, for a major revision for EAD was end of 2020. Um, so uh, we picked the work up after the approval from both committees um, in early 2021. And we essentially used that first year to get a better understanding of the status quo of how EAD is currently being used around the globe, acknowledging the fact that we have next to the usage of the current version EAD3, also quite a big part of the community still using the previous version EAD2002. The second year, 2022, was mainly looking at alignment with ECCPF 2.0, which was published in August of that year, and also looking into TSEES exploration for a standard for functions. Uh, so this will essentially be the frame of today's session. Um, and then the last year, we specifically looked at um, ED concepts, so things that are specific to ED and are not coming uh, into any play in the other two standards that we are working with. Um, and with all of this, this year is very much focused on A, reviewing your feedback, and B, finalizing ED 4.0 in order to then submit that officially for adoption to SAA, probably by early next year, depending on how the feedback um, cycles go and how much feedback you receive and need to uh, cater for. The current call for comments uh, was published as, um, about a month ago on 19th of April. Um, and we had essentially two places where you can find all the information around the call for comments. Uh, we have one on our SAA microsite. Um, so there you will have a short introduction and you will also have links to all the different um, documentation that we have published as part of the uh, current revision. And we will add more documentation as we move along. Similarly, uh, for any one of you who is on GitHub, you will find uh, a dedicated page for these documentations also in our GitHub repository. Um, so essentially both of these places hold the same information. They just cater for different parts of our community depending on whether you are in the GitHub context or not. What we currently have ranges from very general introductory texts, like the posts on the descriptive notes block, to very specific detailed information, like the transformation routes, which essentially uh, gives you uh, an overview per element and per attribute compared to EAD3, what changes for these elements and attributes in the new version. And that is essentially kind of focused around the EAD 4.0 draft schema, which we have available in different schema formats, uh, depending on your preferences. You can use the XSD schema, RNG schema, um, and um, to use that for any exploration of the new version. We are currently also working on a draft tag library, which we will hopefully be able to publish towards the end of June. Um, and we are also working on revision notes and a transformation routes overview based on EP 2002. Again, kind of picking up on the circumstance that quite a lot of our colleagues are still using AD 2002 and we wanted to also make sure that they have an easy way to understand the changes that might apply to them. About the open drop-in sessions, of which we are doing one today, um, these are meant to be relatively informal. So we aim to give a brief introduction on one of the major strands of the revision, uh, and then, then essentially kind of open up the mic for any questions, comments, or suggestions that you might have on the new version. As mentioned, we already had one session on the 24th of April, which was concentrating on introducing the call for comments and ways to contribute to that. Uh, in the meantime, the recordings of these have been published. 
So you have the links uh, to the recordings on YouTube on this slide. Um, today's session, we're going to look into how ED becomes more interoperable with the new version. And then the um, next two sessions that we still have planned on the 18th of June and on the 9th of July, we'll look at how EAD is being extensible and how EAD 4.0 is sustainable and exchangeable. Uh, you have the registration links for both uh, sessions on this slide. Looking at today's topic, interoperability, uh, I wanted to just kind of talk us through um, some aspects uh, of how TSES thinks EAD 4.0 improves on interoperability. Um, and I wanted to start us off with some reasoning of why we looked into aligning EAD with other standards that are often used in combination with it. Um, as you all know, using standards uh, helps us because they provide us with building blocks for managing, publishing, um, and, and sharing information. Um, it makes They make sure that information can be universally understood, independent of your background or your um, current employer organization. Um, so it makes it easier for systems to communicate with one another and to exchange and process data. The benefits of aligning standards uh, that result from those reasonings are that um, they make it more easily accessible to anyone involved in the process uh, of creating, managing, and processing archival descriptions. Um, by using more general terminology. So if someone is involved in the process of creating archival descriptions, who, for example, is used to working with Mark 21, um, using similar terminology as Mark 21 will help in onboarding such a new person. Um, similarly, if you're working with an IT supplier uh, where the developers might not be used to the archival terminology, using more general terminology will also help in your communication with those. So aligning standards also makes them more directly relatable to anyone who is not necessarily part of the archival community. And technically uh, aligned standards are also easier to manage when they are used in combination with each other. So for example, when we look at EAD and ESC, um, if we have, for as an example, the date elements defined in the same way, um, your processor only needs to kind of think of one variation of how to encode a date rather than having to consider two or more variations of it. So the alignment of EAD and ESCCPF um, was, of course, the focus of our work uh, because these are the two standards that we currently have published and are maintaining. Um, and as you know, they mean to cover distinct aspects of archival description, archival materials on the one hand and creators of these materials on the other hand. So they are designed to complement each other. However, in practice, there's quite a bit of overlap between both of them. Um, and that ranges from very general principles like the principle of provenance to more detailed aspects as, for example, yeah. the encoding of dates that I mentioned or also the encoding of places. These conversations in TSES essentially kind of started from the idea of shared elements and attributes. And that not only kind of looked at EAD and ECCPF as the existing standards, but also was looking forward a little bit on ECF for functions. So this new standard that um, another team in TSES has been working on for the last two years um, will also very much kind of pick up on elements and attributes that already exist and are shared between the other two standards. So again, the alignment has been a big part of that creation process. The idea between behind shared elements and attributes is essentially that we want to ensure that if an element or attribute is named with the same name in both standards, um, that this also signifies that they are intended to be used in the same way. 
And this is shown by having them defined in the same way in EAD and in ESCCTF, for example, having the same content model, meaning the same sub elements being available, um, or for attributes, the same data type. Um, and on the flip side of this, uh, we also evaluated that elements with similar names, so not the same name, but similar names, are indeed meant to be either used the same way or differently. And depending on the evaluation results, we made sure that um, a renaming happened so that both have the same name in both standards if they are meant to be used in the same way. Or if they are not used in the same way, that they get more distinctive names and um, differences are also emphasized by potentially a different content model and a different data type in each standard. The specific changes in EAD4 that result from an alignment with ESCCPF, um, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them, uh, and you can read all the details in the revision notes or in some of the other documents that we shared and published already. Um, start with the alignment process, but essentially also point to more conceptual changes that result from that. Um, in this first session, we will look specifically at those that really are about the alignment between both standards. And in one of the follow-up sessions, we will we'll look a little bit more into detail in the conceptual changes that build on those alignment changes. So one of the most obvious changes that results from alignment with ESCCPF is that we are going to introduce camel case spelling. Um, this already existed in the previous version of ESCCPF since 2010 and was considered during the revision of uh, EAD towards EAD3, but not implemented in the end. Um, in general, camel case spelling is considered a typographic and consistent way to separate words uh, by capitalizing the first character of each word, except of, for the first word. So if you have an element name that consists of two or more words, you can more easily kind of distinguish these single words by having a camel case or capital letter um, with the th second or the third word respectively. Um, the other reason why we want to follow that approach is that it is a XML convention and best practice to use camel case spelling, um, specifically because XML is case sensitive. So uh, a biochist element that has all small letters was never actually the same from the XML perspective than a biochist with a capital H in the middle. In general, we uh, are convinced that camel case spelling enhances readability for the human eye. Uh, so it makes it easier to recognize an element or attributes names origin um, and helps in learning and interpreting the standard. And we think this is especially important um, because we have to consider a, a broad international community who uses EED. Um, and many of those don't have English as the first language. So, most of these element names um, that originate from an Anglo-American um, practice of archival description um, become easier to understand and recognize uh, also to the international community by having it spelled in a different way. Just mentioning some examples in terms of which elements are uh, affected by this. Uh, so the biochist element I already mentioned, um, but it also relates to custodist or to other find aid. Um, and also the Archdesk, the archival description element uh, is one of those where we had to camel case spelling. Um, the same is true for kind of um, smaller descriptive elements that you might find in the current DIT element. So date range, date set, from date to date, but also the newly introduced element fist desk structured, uh, which in itself is already kind of hard to pronounce, uh, but even harder to read if you don't have the capital D and S in between. Um, and then essentially all sub elements also in the control section like convention declaration or other agency code, other record ID. We 
also have used the introduction of camel case spelling as an opportunity to review element and attributes names more generally. Uh, specifically looking at abbreviated names or names that consist of acronyms entirely. And we have looked at that from a perspective of aligning terminology with other standards, uh, for example, ISAG, uh, or in the American uh, context, DAX, uh, or also records in contexts as the new standard um, published by the ICA. Um, some examples that fall into that category, uh, and you will see um, some of them would have changed the name anyway because of the camel case spelling. Uh, access restrict and use restrict, which will now be called access conditions and use conditions to um, signify a broader um, usage of these elements. Um, ACK info, um, again, one of those elements that is hard to pronounce, uh, is now named source of of acquisition, sorry. And also apologies for the spelling error, which I will correct before we share the slides. And then some of these acronym um, elements like DIT or DSC or OT, which we have now kind of more clearly named into identification data, description of components, respectively other descriptive info. Apart from these name changes, there also are a few elements and attributes that uh, are changed as a result of the alignment with ESCCF. The most obvious one is the control element, as this is kind of a big section of both EAD and ECCPF that is being shared. Um, a few changes that I wanted to highlight in this context is that we have adapted the sequence of sub-elements, so that essentially the mandatory elements record ID, maintenance agency, and maintenance history come first, which wasn't necessarily the case in EAD3, where maintenance history was coming further down um, when you used, for example, things like convention declaration or rights declaration in between. Uh, we also now require record ID to have content. Uh, so far, you could use record ID just as an empty element. Um, but we think uh, it needs to be um, stressed that uh, when you use ED as an export format, and that does not necessarily mean for sharing only, but it could also be just kind of exporting from one system into a new system uh, internally, uh, then having an identifier for the ED XML file itself becomes pivotal in ingest and update scenarios. That's why we require a record ID to actually have content and not be left empty. Uh, on the contrary of that, we have loosened a little bit the use of sub-elements for the maintenance agency element. So where it currently requires agency name there, it now asks for either agency name or agency code to be present. So uh, if someone, for example, has an internal identifier for the agency or uses something like an ISIL code for the agency, then you can also use that and don't necessarily have to spell out the name. Um, and then one additional bigger change that I wanted to mention is that we have removed the predefined value lists from attributes uh, in the schema. Uh, so for example, the level attribute or the unit date type attribute. Um, and we will give a possibility to define the value lists used in those attributes within control. Um, and you will have a choice between either saying, okay, I'm using the EAS lists. Uh, so for example, in, in the case of level, sticking to what we currently have uh, as a choice between collection, item, file, series, et cetera. Uh, or you can say you're using your own list if some like this exists. The other big change in control refers to the element file desk, um, which still sits in control like it does in EAD header in ED 2002. Um, and we have decided to move the file desk element out of control uh, because that was one of the bigger remaining differences with ESCCPF where this doesn't exist. Um, and we also in this context renamed the element to find a desk. Um, so it now is a sibling element which sits between control and Archdesk. 
Um, and we also made it optional and repeatable. Uh, so essentially, you can now use find a desk to encode information of any instance of the finding aid. So that might be the printed finding aid that you still have on your shelves. It might be different digital file formats of a finding aid. It might be the ED XML file itself, if you consider that a finding aid. And we also are reusing elements that exist in other parts of EAD within Find a Desk, rather than having a set of elements that are only applied specifically in this context. So we are using the general title, uh, a new element called Cited Range, um, the general agent, date, and place. Um, and we also are introducing an element that is called formatting extension for formatted longer text. So that is kind of comparable to if you were using the element front meta with the sub element diff in ED 2002, which we know some colleagues are still doing. The encoding of dates are already mentioned uh, a few times as examples. Uh, this also included uh, some adaption towards ESCCPF. So we are adopting the triad uh, of date, date range, and date set meaning that date single, which was available, for example, in unit date structured, has been replaced with simply date. Um, and we also have ensured that date along with from date and to date, so every element that includes a single date expression uh, comes with the same set of attributes. Um, so you have standard date, not after and not before for normalized dates. Uh, which is if you are using ISO 8601 um, now extended to the newest version, so integrating the extended date time format, which allows you to give normalized variations of uncertain or, or approximate dates. Um, we have calendar era uncertainty to do that in the way of textual information. Uh, and we have included a new attribute called status um, to indicate that, for example, a date is unknown or that the end date of a date range is ongoing. Similarly, we have adopted the uh, way how places and place names are encoded. So the simple geoc name element that exists in ED3 has been replaced by a more generic place element in most contexts. And place in itself enables a choice between place name, place role, place type, address or contact information, or geographic coordinates. Um, and essentially, only one of these has to be present, but you can also use all of them uh, if applicable, and you can also repeat all of them. So uh, if you're using in a multilingual uh, context, uh, then you can give for example, the place name or address details in two different languages or more different languages. Um, furthermore, place in itself, uh, as well as the place name, place role, and place type elements all allow you to point to controlled access terms. Um, so kind of point to an external vocabulary if you have taken the term in the element from there. Another area that we looked at in context of alignment was the inline tagging for shared elements. So that is elements like abstract or P, uh, but it also to a certain extent then um, evolved to other elements that have a similar context in EAD specifically, like the unit title element. Um, and essentially there are two um, things that we've done. We have reduced the mixed content model that is available. And we only have one mixed content model now in EAD4, rather than having different variation of context models as you have in EAD3, where you have a, a basic content mixed content model and then various extension of that. Um, and we are essentially focusing on three elements that you can use in that context. Um, that is an element to refer to an external resource for further reading, the reference element an element to indicate that part of a longer text is um, an entity, so the name of a person or the name of an organization or place or a date. And this is the new element referring spring that we use for that. Um, and an element that allows you to emphasize part of a longer text, for example, if you want to have that displayed differently. 
Um, and here we have adopted the element span, which was available already in EECCPF, rather than keeping the element emf, which was available in EAD. The last two points that I wanted to mention just as uh, some highlights of what we've changed is our internal and external referencing. Um, and for internal referencing, we have essentially extended the use of the already existing target attribute, which is now available with all elements of EAD4 rather than being specific to the element reference or in EAD3 also the pointer element. Uh, so essentially with target, you have the possibility to point to the ID attribute of any other element within the same EAD XML file. And you can also do that for several elements at the same time, because we have adapted the data type to ID refs, so to a multiple um, version of this. And in the similar way, um, there are three attributes that we newly introduced, um, picking up on that from ECCPF as well, um, which are called convention declaration reference, maintenance event reference, and source reference. And essentially, these elements are uh, these attributes are available with all elements that can contain text, and are used outside of the control section. Um, and when you use one of those, you can directly point to a convention declaration, to a maintenance event, or to a source element uh, within the control section, and thereby allowing you to connect a statement being made in the descriptive part of an ED file with a specific source or with a rule or with an agent and a date time when the statement has been added to the finding aid. For external referencing, uh, you probably know that ED already includes uh, various possibilities to refer to uh, controlled vocabularies, thesauri, or authority files. Uh, we have extended that um, massively. So uh, apart from the original controlled access elements, um, this possibility is now available uh, with nearly half of the elements in ED4, um, because we think that a lot of those are essentially kind of used with some type of vocabulary or code list um, as the main con source of content for those elements. In this context, we did uh, two renamings. So what is called identifier in ED3 or auth file number in ED 2002 will now be called value URI. Uh, so essentially giving the URI that represents the value that you have in the element. Um, and that renaming specifically coming from ED3 was mainly done to avoid confusion with the ID attribute. Um, we have renamed the source attribute to more specifically say vocabulary source. Um, and that also avoids having an attribute and an element of the same name, which is one of the design principles of e TSES, which we want to avoid. And alongside vocabulary source, you now also have the possibility to include a URI for the vocabulary. Um, so you can either name the vocabulary or you can point to the URI or you can both of it, uh, can do both of it, depending on what you prefer. And next to that, I already mentioned, there still is the element reference available for pointing to external resources um, that can be analog resources or digital resources. Uh, if it is digital, uh, you will still be able to use uh, attributes like href, link title, and link role with reference. Um, and apart from being um, part of the mixed content model that I mentioned earlier, we also have reference as a direct sub-element of some of the control uh, elements, so convention declaration, rights declaration, and local type declaration, as well as the source element in itself. And with this, I'm at the end of the introductory part. Um, I know I kind of uh, rushed through things, so if there are any questions in terms of going back to something or explaining something in more detail, we can also do that. Um, and I see there are, I think, two comments in the chat or three. Uh, so we'll just kind of start with those and um, 
then you are uh, invited to add either more ch questions in the chat or to just kind of raise your hand and then we can um, make sure that you can unmute yourselves. So just going through the questions as they were dropped into the chat box. Um, there's a question, when will we have revision notes from AD 2002 to four? Um, so we are currently working on this and the current timeline would be uh, towards the second half slash end of June um, that this will be available. Um, I hope that still fits with organizing a, a meeting uh, specifically as it kind of cuts into potential summer holidays. Um, but given the fact that we are all doing this as voluntary work, uh, we have to kind of cater for a few kind of other commitments that we have. Um, then there's a question, will there be an official transformation from ED 2002 to ED 4 so that products already supporting an export to ED 2002 uh, can more easily retrofit ED4 uh, until they can directly export to ED4. Um, this is something that is currently under investigation. Uh, so we are working on a conversion from ED3 to ED4. And as there exists a conversion from ED2002 to ED4, we want to kind of look if we can have kind of a stage process. So convert ED2002 to ED3, and then that follows uh, is followed by a conversion from ED3 to ED4. Uh, or if it makes sense to really have a direct conversion uh, from ED2002. There are a few things like, for example, the find a desk element that I mentioned earlier, where it might make sense to have a direct conversion, because uh, if we were going via ED3, we might be losing parts in between, which we still want to kind of reuse in ED4, um, but we haven't decided that yet. So um, this is something that we will look into, uh, probably not before the summer break, uh, but we have uh, planned a bigger meeting in August of TSES, uh, where this is one of the topics that we're gonna discuss. So hopefully after the summer break, we will have uh, some more news on that as well. Hope that answers the question. Um, then we've got a third question in the chat um, and it's gonna be interesting to see how, how huge it is or not. Um, so the, the comment is, uh, it may be useful to align metadata standards between born digital and digitized archives. Do you plan to re reproduce some OAIS mechanisms into ED4? Uh, and then additional information is included that OAIS defines structure of exchanges, messages to transport technical descriptive preservation metadata and binary documents between two archival systems. Um, I will admit that we haven't looked at this in detail. Um, we generally looked at the question of digital, digitized, digital born material and how that can be represented. Um, this is one of the areas where we will, um, for example, look into some of the concepts introduced with records and context, so with RIC, uh, in terms of the, so what is called instantiations in, in RIC. Um, but yes, so I think Louis, if you if you want to add uh, an issue on GitHub and describe a little bit more and maybe kind of also include some examples on this um, so that we can have a closer look, that would be very welcome. Okay, but one more question. Um... Not linked to today's topic, but um, I think we are fine with kind of expanding that a little bit. Uh, could you please uh, provide more information on the use of forms available to encode DAO of ED2002? This element seems to be very open and accept many ways to encode links to digitized objects. Um, so for anyone who hasn't uh, had the chance to look cl more closely at um, ED4 and how it is presented, 
forms available um, is a new element that we want to introduce. Um, and this is essentially what is picking up on the idea of instantiations in records and contexts. And forms available is um, a, a combination of existing elements, DAO respectively, DAO set in EAD3 or DAO group in EAD2002. And then the elements alt form avail and original slog. So essentially looking at any elements that represent um, a different instance, instantiation um, of the record that is being described in, for example, the C element. Um, and with being a combination of these three elements, um, there are different ways how you can use forms available. You can use it um, with general text, so like alt form avail or origins log are currently used. Um, you can use it with directly providing um, links in form available. Um, so form available is one of those elements that allows you to include uh, vocabulary UIs um, and value UIs. So if, for example, you are using something like the archival resource key or digital object identifiers, so ARCs or DOIs to identify your digital objects, um, you might just kind of put the link uh, to, to that in value UI or form available. Um, and then as hinted to in this um, note by, by uh, Manu Mani, there also is an extended option to use the relations element with form available. So kind of really going into the detail of describing the relationship between um, that instance of, um, or the representation of, of the record that you are describing um, and the analog record, so let's say, for example. So giving information about um, whether or not this, um, uh, let, let, let's say you have digitized material uh, and you have a, a JPEG version for, for publishing and you have a TIFF version for um, uh, digital preservation. And you want to describe both of them, so the, the JPEG and the TIFF version in, in forms available. Um, then you can use the relation element um, to, for example, give the, the relation type as being digitized or derived from um, or using some other terminology that applies in your context. Um, and then you can for, use the additional relation elements uh, to be more detailed and say that, for example, the TIFF version is used for digital preservation and therefore can also be referred to, I don't know, in your digital preservation system, uh, which might come with, with a separate URI or with might come with a separate identifier. Um, I don't know if that is clear enough. Uh, I think if, if we were in kind of a an in-person setting, I probably would be standing in front of a whiteboard and, and drawing the, the encoding, how, how it could look like. Um, it's a little bit tricky to, to do that in, in this online setting. Thank you, Manu Mani. Any other questions from anyone? And again, also just the invitation to, to raise your virtual hand and we can unmute you if you want to ask a question directly. Otherwise we can continue with the chat. If there are no questions from your side at the moment, uh, maybe we can look at a few questions um, that we from TSES side have uh, and where we would very much appreciate your either quick feedback now or input later on, uh, or also kind of just um, feedback uh, in, in either GitHub or other contexts. Um, the, First question that we had uh, specifically for the session today is to just kind of get an understanding if you are 
describing, respectively using records creators' uh, descriptions separately from describing archival materials. So, for example, is there a separate module to do that in the collection management system that you are using, or are you using ECCPF files uh, next to ED files? So maybe just kind of a quick um, show of hands or, or comment in, in the chat, um, how that looks like in, in your context. Or if you are not using that and, and having kind of the records great are described as part of the archival description, which could also be the case. And we've got a raised hand from Michelle, just a second. Um, Hello. Yes. Um, in the um, uh, in the, um, uh, um, university library in France, uh, we describe creators uh, like um, uh, Unimark, uh, uh, like a library uh, for in, in print uh, in authority uh, authority base. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but the authority base in is in MARC and not in a uh, uh, ASCCPF, uh, EIC, uh, CPT. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we've got some more hands raised. Manu Mani, I think you were first. At least you showed up first in my. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, in. Uh other uh, contexts in uh, France, the, in uh, some archival uh, management systems, they have a module uh, to uh, uh, do uh, EAC CPF uh, files. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to promote uh, national uh, EAC CPF uh, uh, reservoir uh, of notices that could be used by uh, uh, public French archives. Okay. So that is kind of an, a, a national pool of um, EAC CPF or records creators description yes. that people can point to. Okay. Yeah. Then we've got a, a and using a 2.0 version. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then we've got a comment also uh, in the chat um, uh, where the colleague is using access to memory, so Atom, um, and there's a separate uh, authority records um, exporting ACCPF uh, module that that they use. So that's that's good to know. Thank you. And then one more, um, currently not using EAC CPF, uh, but managing record creator descriptions in two different databases. Um, okay. <laughs> this, this might be a very specific use case, uh, Andrew. Um, and then uh, two different tables in the same database for the city archives of Gothenburg. Um, Okay, that's that's also good to know. Uh, thank you, um, Ftimios, uh, with regard to same approach also being applied uh, in a new project. So that's obviously something um, picking picked up by the National um, Archives in in Greece. Okay, thank you very much for for this this feedback. Um, that's that's good to to kind of get get the, an overview of the different approaches. Um, uh, another question that we had is just to kind of get an idea of whether or not you encode information about published finding aids of, of any format. So that might be the published finding aid that you still have in the shelf or 
an online version or a digital version? And if so, um, which information you usually capture? So kind of looking at the point that ED3 and ED2002 currently have um, mainly the title proper. So the title of the finding aid as, as a required element, but don't re prescribe anything else. So just just an idea to, to get an understanding of what we have. Um, I see a comment in, in the chat, uh, that the two main software providers for managing archival collections in France, as well as the National Archives of France, um, have a module, ah, that's that's for the previous topic, I think, still. Um, so encoding is CCPF linked to finding aids. Anyone in, in the call today who um, encodes specific information about published finding aids in any more detail? In, uh, in, in universities library in France, we decide recently uh, no more uh, no more front matter no more uh, no more uh, published finding aids um, published is in print I, I don't I understand it uh, we we, uh, we have the book and uh, in uh, in your uh, repository your uh, catalog we only uh, we only uh, describe uh, um, online finding aids. Okay, and what piece of information do you encode for the online finding aids? Is that mainly a title and I don't know the link or anything else? Um, we uh, we recommend uh, systematically to have a URL uh, mm -hmm. if possible, uh, but uh, it's um, uh, the, um, we we recommend to 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 to, to have a, a link. Okay. Uh, in yeah. your catalog, in our catalog, in uh, what else? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I see an additional comment also from France, um, where um, specifically to publish paper finding aids, um, where authors and the date of publication is also encoded. Um, and then Andrew from the UK says, uh, yes, we encode information about published finding aids, um, just plain text statement of basic bibliographic information like author, title, date, and publisher. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, another question that we had refers to this change that we want to introduce to allow more broader use of local value lists next to the value lists that uh, TSEES might define for specific um, attributes. So the level attribute is one example, but there are also other specifically typing attributes um, that in current ver versions of EED come with a predefined list of values, which we would now suggest to remove to open that up to be used with any other type of value list. So we're just wondering if, if um, from your um, approaches, you would have any specific use cases of local value lists that, that you uh, refer to um, that can be really local just for your institution, um, or um, it could be uh, something that is managed on, on a national level maybe. Um, And I'm assuming the yeah the example the the link that you just put into the chat, Brigitte, uh, is is one of those lists, right? Um, yes, it's a uh, all the all the list uh, defined uh, in Calam for the um, university's library. Okay, and it's a little more specific than the than the. Um, uh, list defined with the um, 
uh, national library. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's more more complete, but uh, we we are working with the national library to have mutual and uh, unique uh, value list for all the library in France, university mm -hmm. or or um, public library. Okay, that that is good to have. Thank you very much. Also, good to know about the uh, the work that that happens to to align um, with with the national library. Um, we've got um, one more comment with regard to um, let's say different um, levels of detail, respectively public availability, uh, which is also good. I think that that specifically in the in the digital realm is is uh, something that probably most of us are thinking about more in terms of what can we make available in which context and to whom. Um, so having information on that encoded makes sense. Um, and also good to know the, about the point that um, you also connect that to uh, international uh, lists. Um, Andrew, follow-up question, when you're using other level and other legal status, do you have a, a list of values that you would be using with those attributes or is this kind of anyone's game? Um... Yes, let's just make it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, so I thought it was just easier to um, speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, so, well, um, we do have um, well, we have um, um, standard values that we accept, and we don't accept any others. But that that isn't enforced with a formal value list, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we had a few more comments on that. Um, so, in Sweden, that is uh, managed at the national level uh, with the possibility for other types uh, as well. So um, also good to know um, a working group uh, on description um, in France uh, for, for the archival part is working on something to possibly be published soon. Um, and then in Greece, we have uh, the National Aggregator Search Culture uh, who is um, offering some mapping between international and national lists. Um, I think yeah, that's that's a, a really good resource um, that allows you to kind of extend from something that you might be more used to to something that also kind of spreads the wings a little bit to the international community. Um, and then a last comment also from France uh, about local repository for document types. Um, that's that's also interesting. Um, I think Louis, if if you have an example for that that you could share, that would be really great. I think uh, that would be really helpful also for for others. Just looking at the time, um, we had one one more question, uh, just out of out of interest as well. Um, whether or not in your context you are supporting something like inline tagging or mixed content, and if you do, for which type of information uh, you do that? Or also good to know if you don't do it. Um, that also gives us an indication of which direction the community is taking in this regard. Uh. I, I'm not sure, in light tagging by the users? Or... Um, by the um, archivist or librarian who is creating this, the descriptions. So if you have a longer text, if you have a possibility to specify that part of the text, for example, is the name of a person, 
Oh, we 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 the catalog uh, the person who make uh, I, um, ER in front if I, in your university library must tagging uh, systematically with first name uh, uh, corp name and so on uh, and link to the uh, authority file. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, um, you have to <laughs> uh, when you when you work in Calam. Uh, and the um, uh, online tagging by the user was a total fail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> um, and we also have received a few other comments in, in the chat. Um, so um, Andrew uh, mentions that um, this is specifically used in scope content in, in their context for person names, place names, dates. Um, and a few more, um, while uh, Jakob says that in Gothenburg they are not using inland tagging um, in their current system because it's not supporting it. Um, in France, um, it's used by some institutions for indexation in the unit title and scope content elements. Um, and um, from Greece, uh, we have the info that they are trying to offer such tools for public facing projects um, and do inland tagging more systematically with semantic enrichment. Uh, so also supporting markdown, for example, in scope content. So that's good to know, uh, specifically, I think also with this, this point of um, the public facing um, aspect, I think that's something that of course is coming up more and more um, and, um, so good to, to, to have that in mind. Um, just being mindful of time, uh, and thank you very much uh, also for that last link, Louis. Um, I would like to close the session today uh, just with a reminder that you are invited to contribute to the call for comments. Uh, we have different possibilities how you can do that, either by reporting a bug or a feature request uh, on GitHub or via our web form on the SAA website. Uh, you can also send us uh, some more general comments or questions that you might have where you're not yet sure how to phrase that as a feature request or a bug report um, via email at ts-es at archiv archivists.org. Um, and we are also uh, always uh, very happy to get real life examples with those comments. So if you have a snippet of an EAD file, how you can illustrate um, what you want us to do or want us to support, uh, that always is helpful. Um, so this would be uh, really great and you are all invited to, to join us on GitHub or the web form um, as we go into this call for comments and continue with the development. Um, so that just leaves us with thanking you very much for your attentions and specifically for all your questions and comments in the second half. And if you haven't signed up to them yet, um, just a reminder that we have um, two more open sessions on the 18th and the 18th of June and the 9th of July. Uh, 18th of June is two hours earlier than today. Um, and the 9th of July will be in the kind of morning, midday for the Americas and uh, in kind of the late afternoon, early evening for European time zones. Um, so um, you have the registration links um, in one of the first slides that I showed earlier. So you're welcome to join either both or one of these sessions as well. And with this, I'm going to stop sharing um and um yeah just thank you very much again everyone and uh, i hope you have a good rest of your days thank you for Karsten, for doing this presentation i'm going to stop the recording now thank you <laughs>